Good evening and uh, welcome to the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm Garth Salona. I'm the dean here at the GSB, and it's my privilege to welcome you all uh, to this wonderful event. Uh, I want to thank uh, the award selection committee for uh, this really fantastic selection, uh, as well as all of the companies who have uh, supported us by sponsoring the event. Uh, this is the 36th event of its kind, the 36th annual Encore Award uh, reception, and each year the award is given to an entre entrepreneurial company that embodies uh, the spirit, innovation, uh, and unique culture of the companies uh, that we're familiar with in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And so uh, let me be the first to congratulate Tesla and uh, Elon Musk for uh, the award this evening. Uh, I'm going to uh, be brief before handing you over to, uh, to Jeff, uh, but I, I did want to just spend a few minutes saying a little bit about the things that we've been doing here uh, at the Graduate School of Business in the area of entrepreneurship, and I'm very quickly going to uh, reference uh, three innovations this year. Uh, the first is we have a, an entrepreneurship course uh, and have, have had for many years in which we put our students together in multidisciplinary teams from across the university and they work on projects together. And this year, uh, as a harbinger of technology to come, we have for the first time flipped the classroom. So Stefano Zinios, who teaches the class, recorded uh, what would have been the lectures, and instead uh, the students got to use the class time uh, to be mentored and work together uh, on the projects. And I think that's very much uh, a sign of the times and, and the future. Uh, the second is, many of you will be familiar with a program that we have offered here at Stanford in the summer and during the year, which we used to call the Summer Institute for Entrepreneurship. We now call it Stanford Ignite. This is a, a program that at Stanford was aimed at graduate students at Stanford, uh, not in the business school, so students in, in engineering and medicine and the life sciences and so on who uh, might be starting a company or would be working uh, for companies uh, that, uh, that were innovating, and we give them a general management education uh, with an entrepreneurial and, uh, and innovation spin. Uh, and this year, we, uh, we started to take that, uh, that program globally. So we offered uh, a version of it in Bangalore, India this summer, and are in the midst of teaching one in Paris right now uh, in a partnership with, uh, with the Cold Polytechnique. Um, and that program, too, makes heavy use of, uh, of technology. Most of the classes are actually uh, our faculty beamed from uh, this night management center uh, to those locations. Uh, the final thing uh, I want to uh, reference is, uh, again, many of you are familiar with SEED, uh, which is the Stanford Institute for Innovation in Developing Economies, an institute that we launched here at the business school about two years ago. Uh, and it had a, a landmark event this summer when we opened our first innovation center uh, in Accra, Ghana, uh, where we have, uh, in the first cohort, 29 uh, local entrepreneurs uh, who we are working with to help them uh, to scale their businesses. And it's a, it's a, regional, a regional hub and a regional program with participants from, from five neighboring countries. So lots going on uh, at the GSB uh, while we're uh, helping to make entrepreneurial awards. We're, we're trying to do our bit to uh, to stimulate the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And in that vein, let me just say that in everything we do, we rely uh, very, very heavily on this community. Uh, you come into our classes to help teach and, and, and mentor our students uh, and, uh, and help us in a, in a whole variety of ways. And, and we're extremely grateful uh, and, uh, and delighted to have you all uh, with us this evening. Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Yang, and I have the privilege of chairing uh, the Stanford Encore Award Committee. So you may ask, you know, how do we pick uh, a particular company to win the award? And I'll tell you, we look at four things. You know, the first is uh, companies that embody the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, we look for companies that are doing something big, bold, and important. I uh, look for companies where the founder has or continues to play a very important role in the company's success. And we look at companies that have interesting stories or, who, or whose founders are interesting personalities. So you might say, well, how'd you get Tesla then? It isn't quite. <laughs> so, so the story of Tesla, you know, 
the, so you know, you look how it stacks up, and you say, well, Tesla was, was started by two engineers, uh, Martin Eberhard and Mark uh, Tarpening, who believed that electric vehicles could change the world. OK, check. Uh, Tesla has succeeded in an industry where startups aren't supposed to succeed by incorporating uh, novel design approaches to little things like concept design and battery design and body design and drivetrain design and manufacturing design, supply chain management, and mass production. Tesla is uh, attempting to disrupt, disrupt an industry in which its competitors have massive scale and long histories. Okay, check. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, this, the company's Series A lead investor and now uh, and chairman, continues as its CEO and product architect. Check. And finally, uh, an interesting story. Well, Tesla's practically gone out of business, my understanding is a couple times, and is now a runaway success with a market cap of over $23 billion. Its CEO is the inspiration for the character of Tony Stark in the Iron Man series, according to its director. You know, check, check, kind of an interesting personality. You know, you get the picture. <laughs> Um, Tesla was the first U.S. auto company to go public since Ford Motor Company in 1956. And despite having approximately 1% of the revenues of GM and Ford and BMW, its market cap is roughly a third to a half of these venerable brands. It's my pleasure to introduce Elon Musk. Uh, Elon was a native of South Africa and studied at Queen's University, University of Pennsylvania, and ultimately Stanford to pursue, to pursue a Ph.D. in physics. He started Zip2, a software provider, which was sold to Compaq. He co-founded X.com, which was later renamed to something called PayPal, uh, which was acquired by eBay. He founded his third company, SpaceX, in 2002 and continues as its CEO and CTO, which I hope he'll tell us a little bit about. Uh, he's also the founder and chairman of SolarCity. And then in his spare time earlier this year, he announced a proposal to form a new form of transportation he's working on called Hyperloop. But most importantly, for the purposes of tonight's program, he's CEO of Tesla Motors. Tonight, Tesla, I mean, uh, sorry, tonight, uh, Elon will be interviewed by my friend and fellow uh, Stanford Encore Award Committee colleague, uh, Steve Jurvetson, Managing Director of Draper Fisher Jurvetson. Please join me in welcoming Steve Jurvetson and Elon Musk. <laughs> Someone will yell if we got this wrong. I think they yeah. told us five times. I sit here, he sits there, and I just yeah. as we came up, he's like, which one do I do now? <laughs> so before we start, uh, we're going to try to keep this a little casual and interesting as well as try to get into the mind of Musk a little tonight. And it's a, it's a marvelous place to delve. You'll all have a chance to ask some questions later, so you can start thinking about that now. Uh, I'll start with a, with a few. But as a warm-up, and I think this might be something Elon might like to see, um, about a year and a half ago before Model S shipped, I remember him saying with sort of a gleam in his eye that he relishes the day that he'll be driving around somewhere in Silicon Valley and see a Model S on the road that's not like an employee car that's in testing, but like a real customer like, that he doesn't know. Um, and so as a quick survey of hands, how many people here today saw a Tesla driving around Silicon Valley? <laughs> and I don't mean the one out there, because that means you've all seen multiple Teslas, right? I saw 10, I counted today, just, and I have a short commute. So you know, that dream has become reality, and while what Tesla has done has been a marvel to watch. So I think a lot of folks here, you know, business students, students, you know, friends of the firm, um, are really curious on how this all works. And so if we could, Start with some design questions and then some organizational and people kinds of questions. But starting with design, you know, as you think about the big problems in the world that you are addressing, do you start with a particular product in mind? Like there could be this Model S, there could be this Falcon 9, and then think, how do I get there? Or do you start with saying, there's something broken in the world, and I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to commit to do it, even if I don't know how I get there? Uh, sure. So uh, let's see. Um, Is that on? Yeah, it's, it okay. seems to be good. Um, the, in, in the case of Tesla, SpaceX, and SolarCity, and actually also the um, PayPal and the Zip2 before that. <clears throat> it, it really stemmed from when I was in college. I was trying to think what would uh, most affect the future in, in a and in, in a very likely to be a positive way. So um, the the three areas where, where I was quite sure it would be positive were sustainable energy, internet, and making life multiplanetary. And then there were a couple other areas where it's maybe a question mark. Uh, like AI and writing genetics. 
And uh, what was the last one? Uh, re yeah, rewriting genetics. Rewriting genetics. Oh. Yeah. So it doesn't have <laughs> um, big impact. It's good to know where phase uh, three and four might come. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. potentially negative consequences, hopefully positive, but good. something could go wrong. So do you have like they make a order? Like, was so. they top three and a couple of contenders, or were they always kind of jumbling around, waiting no, for the I right just moment? Thought, you know, if you look, if you look ahead and say, what's what's really going to have a, a an important effect on the future of humanity as a whole? I, I, those were the five areas that um, that I could come up with standing in the shower, basically. You know. Uh, so there's this moment of epiphany that, that you held for a while because you didn't pursue those right away, right? These were, this was sort of an early vision that you then got opportunities to execute on. Um, yeah. So when you, maybe if we pick an example like Tesla going towards the Model S or SpaceX going towards the Falcon 9, do you commit the team, yourself, your resources to that endeavor, you know, now a little farther along, when you have the end point in mind or just let's say the, the cost of goods analysis for the rocket or the, gosh, EV should be better than internal combustion engines. Just in general, I'll commit. I'll believe that that should be done. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I mean, I didn't really get into any of this with, with the expectation of success. Mm. Um, or at least, um, yeah. I mean, I, I started out with thinking, okay, I'm gonna do something in the electric vehicle space. And that's why I originally came to Stanford was to uh, work on uh, advanced energy storage uh, technologies, in particular uh, ultra capacitors. Um, so that was continuing on research that I'd done as an intern in Silicon Valley in the summer prior. Um, so th so that's, that's why I originally came out in 95. And then during that summer, I wrote some internet software. And I thought, OK, I can either work on electric vehicle technology or, or I could sort of work on internet stuff. Um, to try, try to do something with the internet. And I thought the internet would be something that would dramatically affect the future of humanity. It would be like, uh, like acquiring a nervous system. Um, mm. And whereas previously, communication would have to occur almost by osmosis, you know, from one person to another, or slowly through telephone or mail or something like that. But in, in now, um, if you have a nervous system, any part of the sort of human collective know, can know about any other part instantly. Um, and uh, you know, previously, you'd have to be at the sort of Library of Congress, even to have the Library of Congress as sort of information. Um, but with everything digitized and access anywhere, you could be in a jungle in South America, and, and if you had just an internet link somehow, you could you'd have access to all of humanity's information. So it would actually effectively create a superorganism um, and, and fundamentally change the nature of humanity itself. So I, was kind of, I just wanted to be kind of part of that is that the path uh, to AI that you might see? It's, it's actually not exactly AI. It's um, some sort of human machine collective intelligence. Um, so different, different from AI. Although AI may not turn out to be exactly what, hopefully not, it's not exactly what's you know, like described in Terminator or something. You know? Now, um, a quick pause. For those who haven't been to SpaceX, the data center has got to be the coolest thing you've ever seen. It's you know, Skynet on the door, Cyberdyne systems branding yeah. and loading. <laughs> the most badass set of lights coming from all the yeah. linking servers, so you don't own it. Exactly. Yeah. Our FBA and CFD cluster is, is, is called Cyberdyne systems. <laughs> We'll get back to influences uh, 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 later on, but I want to try to see if I understand what you were saying about this, this. You see the long arc of, and what's important to humanity, not little problems, but huge problems that can be solved. Um, a lot of us go around and we see something frustrating like traffic on the 405, and right. we just take it as, well, crap, government screwed, you know what are we gonna do, right? You have this incredible uh, sort of scope of ambition, right? Planetary scope, interplanetary scope, right? Yeah. A little more than just changing the world, let's change some other worlds too, right? And this is, Big stuff. Was that always in your mind, or did that did you become more emboldened over time that this is available? We can do these things. It definitely emboldened over time. I mean, at the you know, when I started the first uh, internet company, Zip2, um, uh, with my brother and, and another person, um, yeah, Greg Curry, the uh, it wasn't really with the thought of being wealthy. It, it, you know, I've got nothing against being wealthy, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll get back to that later too. <laughs> but but it's just it it was just from the standpoint of been wanting to be part of the, the internet and uh, I, I I figured if we could make enough money to just get by it would be that would be okay. Um, and when we when we started off uh, we had, we we literally only had like one computer and so it would be our web server during the day and I'd code at night um, and we we just got a a, a, a small office um, 
in, in Palo Alto back when rent was not insane. Um, and uh, it, I think it cost us like $450 a month. It was cheaper than an apartment, so we actually just slept in the office and then, sh and then shower at the YMCA at Page Mill El Camino. So we'd walk over there and, and, and shower. And, uh, and that was um, actually, I think, uh, that was when I, f we first, I first met you, by the way. Um, and uh, so I don't know if how many people, no, probably not many people know this, but uh, uh, we actually pitched uh, Steve in like January 96 on uh, the, the Zip2 business plan. Uh, and actually, I thought um, Steve was actually one of the most up to speed on on, on what actually was in our business plan. Most, most of the people we met did not actually read our business plan. Um, in fact, a lot of people, we, a lot of venture capitalists we met at the time didn't even know what the internet was. Or, or they've, never used, they've never used it. Sure, they didn't think I'm not sure if we anything. still do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm talking like, you know, sort of well-known people on Sand Hill. It was like, wow, okay. Um, but, but at the time, nobody had made any, any money on the internet, so I guess uh, that's... Um, you know, it, then it wasn't really clear evidence that, that there was, was a business, um, and um, yeah. Um. Those were fun times. I remember Kimball and you coming in. And right. Very young looking guys. <laughs> That's what I was saying. Yeah. I, I think I was in my first four months on the job too. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh. so um, let's switch gears for a sec. I've, um, I've also had the great honor to work with Steve Jobs uh, briefly, um, but enough, and as a business school student, to study him with as much scrutiny as I could during that period. Um, and there's some obvious parallels. Um, and so let's start with the most obvious, but just must be like the elephant in the room. Is, is the secret to your success to be the CEO of two companies at the same time? No. <laughs> I think it's... Because uh, look at the correlation. Yeah. Struggling companies, everything's in the craft can in December 2008. So let's take on a new CEO gig. And, yeah. And same for Steve, coming back to Apple. Uh, right? No, it de definitely it was not my intention to be CEO of two companies. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, after, I mean, the, I, I, there are certain things that I, I kind of wanted to, I thought it were important to happen, and I thought it was important that, um, that, that there was, that, that, that an electric vehicle happened, that there was a, a success in the electric vehicle arena. Uh, because the, the the incumbent companies were convinced that it was not possible to create a, an electric car that looked good, had range, a good range performance, and so forth, um, and that even if you did make such a car, it would not sell, because uh, people had uh, this love of gasoline, um, and uh, so we had to show that it was possible to create a compelling electric car, long range, good looking, you know, all, all those things. That, that was a Tesla Roadster. And if you created, if, if if you made such a thing, people would buy it, um, and uh, so so that that's that's what uh, we, we try to do with with, with Tesla. If, if by the way, I should, I should say like one minor sort of some correction on the on the introduction. I, I I'm I'm not a I'm not a co-founder of Solar City, but I am a co-founder of Tesla. <laughs> that's right. Okay, um, so that's a good point. So, um, and but, product architect of yeah, many yeah. of its key features. So very much like Jobs, both the hand and some of the detail as well as the long arc of what's important um, right. for the company. The, 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 the quip though about being co-CEO is, is more than just a joke in that I wonder if in ways that are hard to predict and you wouldn't set out for this amount of work, right? it's, it seems insane, uh, but inevitably I, both companies cannot expect more than half your time at most. It sort of yeah. naturally forces a delegation upon you and an expectation they have to rise up for partial awareness at best, right? Yeah. And I just wonder if that helps drive prioritization and really focusing on what's mm -hmm. important a bit more than you otherwise might have to. It probably does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I probably do. Yeah, I mean, because I, I have to triage the, the things that I do at, e at each company um, and constantly think about w what is the most useful thing that I could that I could do. Um, but e even with that, it's that it still actually does take an enormous amount of time. Um, and, for, and for a while there, I was just doing constant hundred-hour weeks, um, and uh, that's that's definitely wearing. Um, and, and, you know, now I'm kind of in the 80 to 90, which is more manageable. Um, uh, but, but, you know, that if you divide that by two, it's only like, you know, maybe 45 hours at, for a company, which is not, not much if you're when there's a lot of things going on. You're like a slacker. I mean, you're really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, you know, it, it, it is interesting also how you have a love for certain aspects of the product. So at SpaceX, you, you know, the, the whole concept and the vision of going to Mars, back into features and stuff, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. I think 
what, what obviously should strike folks in the room um, as remarkable is the diversity of industries that you tackled, right? From commercial banking to the military industrial complex to the automotive industry. These are heavily regulated industries that generally investors flee from and startups routinely fail in and they haven't seen much change for good reason over decades. So there might not be a, an obvious pattern in which industry you tend to thrive in, but I wonder if there's a pattern perhaps in process. Like, do you approach each of these perhaps the way a software architect might, to think of a, a different way to bring innovation, a different way to um, reset you know, for first principles perhaps instead of iterating from the past, um, a breakthrough, and is there a reason you end up in these otherwise really tough industries? I mean, is, I don't know if that's ever occurred to you that you don't, even with Solar City going up against the regulated utilities, these, yeah. none of these are <clears throat> places that you would normally find uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, like I said, it, it was not from the st standpoint of like what's the best risk adjusted rate of return or, <laughs> you know, uh, where I think it, it things could be successful. It's just like I think these things need to happen, we try to make them happen. And um, w certainly when we started uh, SpaceX or Tesla, um, I, I thought the probability of success was less than 50%. Mm. Um, you know, probably a fair bit less than 50%. In the case of Solar City, um, I thought this, the probability of success was probably greater than 50%, but it wasn't clear what the magnitude of success would be. It, you know, it could just be small. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, but, it, but it was, uh, I mean, I just thought these were things that needed to get done, and even if the money's lost, okay, it's still worth trying. Um, so you had conviction, but it didn't mean certainty, right? You knew I, that I, all vehicles would be electric. In your heart, but not ultimately, that Tesla would ultimately necessarily yes. succeed. I mean, yeah. I think the sort of fundamental good mm -hmm. that Tesla uh, can accomplish is acceleration of of the inevitable, which is electric transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's, there's a lot of value to to accelerating, the, um, even though I think it's somewhat inevitable. Um, it's there's value to accelerating it to minimize the 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 environmental and the economic damage that would otherwise occur. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, it's better if, if we trans transition to sustainable transport 10 years or, or maybe 20 years sooner than might otherwise be the case. Right. Um, and I think the Tesla's effect has been much greater than the cars that made, that's made internally mm -hmm. because when we announced the, the Tesla Roadster, uh, then um, uh, Bob Lutz, who was vice chairman of GM at the time, saw our press release and said if, if a small company in California can do it, then, then so can GM. And he took it to his engineers who told him that, that you couldn't build an electric car and told him that they needed to get going. And that's what got the vault rolling. Um, and that in turn uh, got Nissan to do the leaf. And, and so it's kind of got, the, got, got things going. Um, but right. now, and ultimately, it's, like, it's what we induce other companies to do that will have a greater impact than the cars we make ourselves. And it's an interesting point I'm going to come back to later, this idea that Tesla's founding mission is, as Elon is articulated from the very beginning through the most recent reports uh, to the public is to catalyze an industry shift that Tesla will be some part of, but to help others in that shift as well, which is remarkable. Right. Um, so we, yeah. we supply powertrains to Toyota and to Mercedes, exactly. for example. So help what could be viewed as your com biggest competitors one day, uh, you yeah, know, absolutely. to fact, accelerate that. Before we get to that sort of purpose-driven mission, I do want to ask, what the, or at least maybe make sure the audience realizes how cool this car is, um, and, and so Elon doesn't have to do this. Um, it, in case you haven't been as much of a fan as the two of us, um, it's a bit unprecedented, the reviews it's received. Um, Consumer Reports saying it's the best car they've ever tested. Uh, Road & Track saying it's the most important car in America's history. Um, the safety testing showing it's the most safe car ever manufactured, um, by far, including vans and SUVs. And so it's pretty remarkable to hit peg performance, desirability, safety, and all these parameters. So is it luck, or is there something particularly unique about the EV design space that let it be possible to build the best car? Um, well, I think you know, luck does play some role here, but I think, we, I think electric vehicles have a fundamental architectural advantage. If, if one designs an electric vehicle from the ground up and takes advantage of, of what's possible, like if you just were to convert a gasoline car, you would not um, you would not achieve these advantages. Um, but if it's properly done, uh, you, you can actually package the battery pack in the floor pan um, and achieve a low center of mass uh, and, and have a very compact motor uh, and, and inverter and, and gearbox um, so that, that the actual usable space in the car is significantly greater than a gasoline car of the same uh, overall external, external dimensions. Um, and um, 
And then if you do a few other things, which aren't necessarily specifically related to an electric car, like using an aluminum body and chassis is, is helpful because uh, you can absorb more energy per unit mass, essentially, in, in a crash. Um, like a Kruppel zone. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, so the, yeah, but part of it's related to electric vehicle architecture, and part of it is related to other technical decisions that, that were made in the design of the Model S. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what leads to sort of having a high safety uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sort of go into too much detail because right. it might take up too much time, sure. but right. um, like I wrote but a blog did you, piece. Did you know some of those things at the get-go or did they unveil themselves as you went along? Like, I'm, I'm just yeah. curious how the vision materializes. Before, like along either sure. the product dimensions, like it will have all these great features, like, like at the get-go, did it all gel? And then secondly, I'm, I'm also curious, when did you first know that all vehicles would be electric? Like, was that oh, early? It was immediate? probably like, 22 years ago, something like that. Before you met Tesla? Before, way before, before there was Tesla. Tesla. Before there was, mm -hmm. way before there was Tesla. Oh, yeah. Well, well like I said, it, wow. um, you know, when I originally came out, when I, uh, I mean, when I was studying physics at Penn, um, that's probably when I, th I thought it was the case. Or maybe, no, sooner than that. Um, probably when I was in my sophomore year in college. Did, did you have certainty in your heart? Yeah, absolutely. It's super obvious. Yes, yes, now. Yes, now it is. And it, well, there are some I think doubters. it was super obvious then, but yeah. that, This is what blows my mind, because even like three years ago, most people probably didn't agree with this point of view. And if I could be confident of any prediction I could make, it's that within 10 years, all people will be of this point of view. Um, yeah. But we won't have made the transition yet, but we'll realize that there's, it's a ridiculous debate to be having. Um, yeah. You were a lone voice of sorts back then, probably amongst your cohort and friends and you know social uh, yeah, actually, I used to talk to like dates um, about electric cars. <laughs> How'd uh, they go? It wasn't wasn't helpful. Um, <laughs> um, it got better. <laughs> uh, yeah. So actually, I ran into a, a girl I dated briefly um, in, in Canada, Christy Nicholson. She's now at, like a writer for Scientific American, and uh, and she mentioned, yeah, when we went on a date, uh, I asked her, do you ever think about electric cars? And she said, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a while back. Um, I mean, it's pretty. I mean, almost everything's electric that we have in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. if it, if so it was from the physics of it. The, yeah, the heat yeah, loss absolutely. of an internal combustion engine just. It's, yeah, it's pretty um, amazing. Pretty amazing. So, I want to I want to share a little story that leads to a question along a different angle. I don't think you've heard this before. So, but I find it fascinating. I was at a um, lunch at a Google event, and out of the blue with no expectation this would be a topic, Larry Page turned to me, knowing a little bit about our connection, and said, you know, how much money do I have? And he mentioned a number, I thought that was cute, um, that he was trying to recall that. He goes, you know, if I were to get hit by a bus today, I should leave all of it to Elon Musk. Really? Yeah. He said that? <laughs> yeah. And, and so I'm like, um, paper or pen? <laughs> Can we please get this down on? Yes. So he, li he likes zingers. I he know likes that, to actually. Like, yes. he's, like, he's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, so context is important. I, actually, you know, I, met, I, met, yeah. I met Larry before he got venture funding. Uh, oh, really? So, yeah. Uh, so wow. this, that's like 97 Back in the garage or days. something. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, he's a remarkable guy, obviously, also an underachiever. And um, you know, has a company that wants to do good in the world. Right? Yeah. And I think he looks <clears> at you with a bit of envy. Because what he then proceeded to say was, you know, I could give my money to a nonprofit and a lot less would get done than a corporation that's pursuing things that are directly aligned with things I care about, like getting off of oil and colonizing other planets. He believes in those missions and thinks that a corporation, if endowed with the right to do that as its business purpose, um, is the best vehicle out there and wishes he could do more of that um, uh, in his own life. He compared uh, poignantly, I think, to some other software companies in the Pacific Northwest who might have executives who do evil for the first part of the career, then do good for the second half, and then, <laughs> and then the sad story of others who never get to the second half of their life, right, like, right. like Steve Jobs. Um, uh, I mean, not in a joking way. I mean, I mean seriously. And, and 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 it was a very deep moment. So um, it raises the question of a purpose-driven business. So you've heard already that Tesla is not just trying to make money. That is not the priority. In fact, if you read the most recent shareholder letter, yeah, it says it, profits it, yeah. are not. In fact, I started yeah. off the the shareholder letter mm -hmm. saying the profits are not our primary goal. Um, and then uh, I, I got a little bit of um, uh, some of my, the board members who questioned that uh, statement. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, it's true, you know. Um, 
And well, like, like, like for now or like just, just while we're growing, but no, just not the priority, which, which I think in a business school is a really good point to dwell on I mean, for a moment. Yeah, yeah it's, not that I, it's not that I think they're unimportant or anything. It's just not the primary goal. That's right. um, and uh, I actually told people that on the IPO as well. Uh, and so it's not like new information, um, or at least, you know, if, if people had watched the IPO, it's not new information. Um, and uh, yeah, and actually, uh, amazingly, the stock went up after mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so, so I, th I think there's a profound reason. I mean, you, you see the benefits of being focused on something that's a higher calling as your primary motivation. Your employees love it, the customers love it, yeah, partners love I mean, it, right? Yeah. And you feel better about your job. The interesting thing, the irony perhaps, is that at least within our portfolio, the companies that have that kind of a founding principle actually make more profit and grow their revenue more quickly than the ones that don't. And now it's this low sample set, but the handful that have taken this bold of a step to say, no, 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 that we will not make that our number one priority, actually do a great job. And it occurred to me, and I don't know if this was conscious in your head at, at some point, that if you weren't wildly profitable, the auto industry wouldn't follow you. In other words, this whole mission of catalyzing a shift to a new electric vehicle isn't gonna work if the business model's worse than the current business model. And so even, yeah. you know, it's, it's the obvious byproduct of what you're focusing on. Well, not obvious, but it occurs to me that it's a byproduct. Um, it wasn't obvious at first at all. <laughs> but uh, I'm curious if that thought occurred to you that, oh yeah, the profits will come. Or, yeah. Eh. Uh, well, we have to generate uh, positive cash flow, or we have to generate enough cash flow to fund future developments, which requires having a good gross margin um, and, and so I guess one could just say, okay, well, we're gonna stop developing new products and then you would be really profitable. So at any given point, you could sort of say, well, we could be profitable you know, at this point um, in, in a significant way, but, but we've got these great things that we wanna develop for the future and they're a good investment and that's what we're doing. And similarly at SpaceX, the, you know, the founding vision was to colonize Mars um, yeah. indirectly. Again, interestingly, catalyzing others well, to move. Yeah. Um, and then you realized, hey, I've got to actually lead this charge, right? Yeah, well, I mean, with SpaceX, uh, originally I started off just thinking, well, how do I uh, increase NASA's budget? Actually, mm -hmm. that was my goal. Um, <laughs> so I was, it was like uh, 2001 with just, just talking to a friend of mine, and he asked, me, he asked me what I was going to do after PayPal, and I thought, well, you know, I was wondering, like, um, I'd like to get involved in space, but I, I just didn't think there was anything I could do as an individual. Um, and, uh, but I was curious as to when, we'd, when we'd, NASA would be sending a, a, a team to Mars, because that was always going to be the thing to do after the moon. Um, I figured that, that there'd be some plan, and I'd just go to the website, and, and I could read the, you know, the schedule. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> then Mars occurs. So, oh, yeah. It's like, okay, 2017, good. Okay. Um, but, but actually, there wasn't anything on, on the website. And, um, <laughs> or at least I thought, like, am I, can I not find it? Like, what's going on here? Um, and is it secret? I don't know. Uh, so, but it turned out that, um, th that NASA had done a study on what it would cost to send, to, to do a um, manned Mars mission, and uh, this was under Bush the first. And uh, he, in, his, in his first, he asked for a 90-day study shortly after uh, taking office, and NASA came back with a $500 billion price tag. And he said, okay, maybe not. Billions uh, would be. That's yeah. when $500 mm -hmm. billion dollars was serious money. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, for the government. Um, so, uh, so, so then that got totally shelved, and it was like you were not allowed to talk about any kind of crewed mission to Mars at NASA. Hmm. Um, anyway, so I, but I thought, well, uh, if I can do something that would um, galvanize public interest, that and and then that public interest would translate to uh, additional appropriations for NASA and increase the, their budget, then then maybe they could do it. So the first, so actually, what I sort of thinking I would do is uh, send a, a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars with seeds and dehydrated gel, and then upon landing, hydrate the gel or grow the plants. And the public tends to respond to precedents and superlatives. So this would be the furthest that life's ever traveled, the first life on Mars. Um, and uh, you'd have this great shot of green plants on a red background. And um, I thought, okay, maybe that would get some- The money of, shot. You got a beam that would be the money shot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm never quite sure whether that's a sort of a, a word you can use or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> now I'm realizing maybe I should. <laughs> you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know its origins until somebody pointed it out to me. But, um, so. <laughs> okay, moving back to that greenhouse on Mars. <laughs> yeah, so um, the photo is uh, out there and it inspires yeah, so, others. Yeah, so you get this yes. great photo. Um, and, and, uh, and I thought, okay, well, if we could make this happen, this would be cool. And 
that NASA would get the money and they could do the, they could sort of send a team to Mars and it'd be great. Um, so I tried to try to figure out how to do this with the proceeds that I had from from PayPal, um, and uh, I was able to figure out how to get the cost of the the spacecraft down and the communications and and, and the um, little greenhouse and everything, but the one thing I couldn't compress was the cost to launch because mm -hmm. there are only a few options, and the U.S. options are way too expensive. Um, and so I ended up going to Russia three times to try to buy uh, the, the biggest ICBM in the Russian nuclear fleet. Um, <laughs> That's where I'd start. Yeah. Yeah. Go big that or go was, home. Uh, right? yeah. I mean, okay. You know, <laughs> they, they, um, it, it was uh, there was some strange trips. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's like virtually, like you can buy any. It's a very capitalist society in <laughs> some ways. Uh, um, so I actually did negotiate a deal to, to buy two of the ICBMs minus the nukes. Um, and, um, but, but I came to the conclusion after that third trip that um, it, it wouldn't really matter. Like if, if we, I actually came to the conclusion that my initial premise was, was, was wrong hmm. um, because I, I actually think there's, there's a tremendous amount of will uh, in the American population particularly, uh, to, uh, to explore. Um, uh, the United States, you know, maybe more than any other country, um, is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Um, and it's really fundamental to psyche. So if people think there's a way, I think it would actually get a lot of support. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, they need, it, it can't be just banging your head against the wall. You've got to believe that this can be done without mm. breaking the federal budget. Um, so uh, that's when I said, okay, well, is there some way to affect the cost of space transport? And, um, and, is, or, and, and so I, I got together with a group of people over a series of Saturdays just to, just to try to understand, is there something super ex fundamentally super expensive about rockets, or, or can the cost be substantially improved? Um, and um, I had, we had a bunch of those kind of brainstorming sessions, and I couldn't see I couldn't see any fundamental obstacle to improving the cost of rockets, so mm -hmm. that, that's when I started SpaceX. It's like, I'll just build them myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, But like I said, right? at that point, mm -hmm. I would say the, the probability of success was definitely less than 50%. I thought it would most likely mm -hmm. not succeed, um, but it was worth a try. But it's fascinating. So the parallels are, are so many between these companies. It's again, probability is low. Certainty yeah. that it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, certainty that it could be done by yeah. for physics and first principles that it's that success is an option, right? It's one of the possibilities. And interestingly, starting with a Roadster and a Falcon 1 as a proof point to yeah. a larger design. You know, as I look at the Falcon 9, and it looks like the product of a software engineer. Modular <laughs> right. reuse, like let's build one engine and step and repeat, and building all kinds of elegance into the system design to abstract away you know, almost from the hardware into the software or into the design, the beauty of the system. And, and I wonder if that's why incumbents don't see the sort of re-engineering of the, of the car or the rocket or the or what have you. The Hyperloop is this, they don't approach it in that kind of blank sheet of paper. How would you do this if you didn't have to create jobs across districts yeah. or you didn't have some other ulterior motive? Interesting, interesting. Looking at the time, I want to give a, I'm going to ask one last question, but I'll give a heads up on if there's mics to start getting them ready for the audience, because I don't want to monopolize uh, people's time here. Um, actually, there's so many questions I want to ask, but, but I'll, what I'll start with, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try to end here for at least a, 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 some of a quirky one about influences. So you, uh, uh, we've heard about the, the uh, Iron Man reference and your childhood interest in comic books and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Asimov. It, um, but there's all kinds of things woven into like Cybernine systems at, at SpaceX that we heard, and then some Easter eggs. So some of us noticed that the stereo goes to 11 on, right. on, the, on yeah. the Tesla. This is a spinal tap exactly. reference for those who know that this one goes to 11 and you need just, just one more. It's louder right? than loud. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. But no one seems to have noticed the product lineup. So you got the Model S, you got the Model X. Oh, yeah. You've just trademarked the Model E. Yeah. No one's met I mean, anything. Yeah, you got to. And the model. Add and some. the model Y. Yeah. Now, what's behind this? <laughs> I know exactly. Well, there's not, I guess there's not a lot of humor in trademark, uh, the trademark law, you know. Because um, yeah, obviously we just trademarked sexy. Um, so, uh, and and then we're having this this discussion with the like Ford because um, they, um, the, the Ford's council, uh, uh, they also didn't get it like. Because they're, they're sort of slightly opposing us using Model E, 
Mm. Um, and then they saw that we registered Model Y, and they said, oh, you're planning to use Model Y instead of Model E. Like, no, it was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> right, we don't do that. <laughs> like, what does it spell? Come on. Um, Fantastic. Well, do we, uh, I'll keep going if we don't, but do we have microphones for folks if they want to ask questions? Okay. Let's do a quick, uh, see if anyone, had, oh my gosh, yes, we have some. Why don't we do that? Let's take a couple questions from the audience. And I'll let you guys figure out how to do the allocations. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I've heard you talk about uh, supersonic aircraft. Um, <clears throat> you guys have done some beautiful work at SpaceX on VTOL. Uh, uh, cl clearly, Tesla is, is focused on electric. Uh, have you thought about the, the synergies of electric and VTOL and aircraft for yeah. solving the 405 <laughs> challenge? <laughs> for solving the 405 problem, well, um, <laughs> I mean, I do think there's, there's a, there's a and really... And VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, sorry. Yeah. Uh, vertical takeoff and landing is VTOL. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think there's, there's a really, um, like the, I think the optimal sort of air transport solution is a VTOL uh, electric supersonic plane. Um, and, and it actually works together quite well for a, a bunch of reasons. Um, you, uh, in, in, in particular, the higher you go, the the better the electric, the more efficient the electric aircraft is. Whereas if you have a combustion aircraft, as you as you get higher, it, get, it tends to get worse because uh, you have a kind of a fixed aperture uh, and uh, air scoop. Yeah, like the, the engine is uh, the hole in the front of the engine is 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 a fixed size, and so you have to pick a particular cruising altitude, and so you've got to figure out how do you uh, get the right amount of air at sea level all the way through really high altitude. Um, and then you've got this issue of super, supersonic combustion that you know you see you end up having to slow the air down, and, and it ends up being um, not, not that efficient. But an electric after aircraft would just get better and better as as it got uh, higher. Um, and then electric uh, motors have a higher uh, power to weight ratio than a combustion engine, so you could ha you could actually have the power to do the vertical takeoff and landing part with a fairly small motor um, compared to uh, combustion. Um, and then you could get rid of um, the uh, elevator and uh, and rudder, so you, you you don't need the rear control surfaces if you gimbal the end uh, the, if you gimbal the motor. Gotcha. So it starts to look like a pod craft, like in yeah, Oblivion or something. <laughs> right. Um, that, so it's it's yeah, it's not something not, not quite. It, the the real trick of it is like how do you make it really long range and um, at least as safe as existing aircraft. Uh, but those are really the only two questions on that front, I think. Um, uh, but they're, they're tricky. Uh, they're certainly tricky. Don't underestimate those uh, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Let's go to uh, the next one, or whoever has a mic, however we're doing the allocation fairly and efficiently. Maybe give him a hand. OK, no, that we have someone. Great. Hi, Yan Gu, uh, GSB94. Hey, Steve. Hi. <laughs> Long time no see. Um, uh, one question, Are you, is Tesla going to expand the worldwide? And I think GSB is going to ho uh, host uh, China 2.0 tomorrow. And do you have any plans to go into the biggest uh, car market today? But I know you are a little concerned through another friend of mine. I, actually asked you indirectly a few years ago that you were concerned about um, um, the, the secret and uh, um, the parroting in the Chinese market. Are you still concerned about that or you have a strategy? Uh, yeah, so, so Tesla's definitely going to ship worldwide. In fact, uh, our, the Tesla Roadster is in 31 countries right now and we, we expect uh, to ship uh, the, the Model S to, to China starting next year um, as well as to uh, Japan and Hong Kong and, and you know uh, Singapore and a number of other and Australia and so so really it's going to be uh, quite widely distributed uh, next year. Uh, certainly China is an extremely important market. Uh, in fact, uh, for premium sedans, uh, in, uh, um, China is about half the world market for for premium sedans. Um, so if you take and growing, like, right? yeah, so if you take something like the Mercedes S Class. But uh, last year, 54 percent of Mercedes S Classes were sold in China. So a pretty important market. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, so we're going to definitely um, uh, do a major uh, push in, in, in China. And, and actually, some of the most uh, enthusiastic potential customers we've seen are people from China. So, um, we, so we actually want to make sure that the car 
uh, ha actually has features which are um, specific to the Chinese market um, and, and make sure that it's not just you know, taking an American product and you know, just sort of sending it to China without any, any changes. So we want to make sure it's tailored to the market. Um, and uh, at, at Japan as well, I don't want to, you know, you know a lot of, it's not many American cars sell in Japan, but I think that would be <coughs> like, we, we, we should, symbolism. Yeah, I mean, like, I think we, we should take the Japanese market seriously, and, and, um, and I think if we do things right, we, we should have reasonable sales there. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, that's going to be uh, next year. <clears throat> I mean, as far as copying stuff, I think that, that's certainly a risk. I, I think China's actually getting a lot better um, these days, and I, and I think the, the new government is taking, taking intellectual property a lot more seriously. Um, so I'm actually starting to feel more and more confident about uh, that the, the technology not actually not being copied in, in China, or at least, you know, it, it getting much better. Um, and I, I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue until we want to establish local production, and that that's that's where, you know, we need to make sure that we we do it right, and um, there's not an incentive for the, the factory team that we establish there to sort of go across the road and create a competing factory. Uh, but but that that concern is a few years away. Great. Do we have another one? Oh yeah, up upstairs. here. And the students are largely upstairs. Yep. Is that up right? Here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alan. <laughs> this is Gabriel Parra, MBA student. Uh, first of all, thank you. It is very inspiring to hear an experience about actually you know changing the world using our organizations as the, the organization that you created. Um, hopefully, we will inspire another Iron Man movie as well. And I was wondering if you can tell us more about the experience about like, you know, um, <coughs> how to balance, you know, those trade-offs between your profits and, you know, following purpose that goes further than just make money. You know, you are trying to change the world, you know, well for our, the humanity rather than just make profits in the short term. So what was the question? I'm not sure if I... Okay. Uh, how, how, do we, how do you balance? Okay, the, how do you balance? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I should say, you know, with <coughs> with 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 um, all of the companies, but but I think particularly uh, SpaceX and Tesla, although they're you know in a, in a, in a good position today, uh, they went through some super tough times, um, and and in fact, uh, for SpaceX, I, I reserved the capital to to do three to have three launch failures, or. or, or to, to withstand two launch failures and, and have the third one be a success, sort of three strikes. Um, and actually, we had three launch failures. We were just able to scrape enough money together for a fourth flight that succeeded uh, in 2008. And then also in 2008, uh, as Steve knows, we, <laughs> we, we, we got the Tesla financing round done on the last hour of the last day. It was uh, like 6 p.m., December 24, 2008. And if we hadn't gotten it done then, uh, the, the company would have gone bankrupt a few days after Christmas. So yeah. these, this what he's not mentioning very is narrow. the only reason that happened is he wrote a check for the re remainder of his wealth to save the company during payroll and Christmas when no one else would. And Goldman had just failed a private offering, and the financial collapse was amongst us. There was no DOE loan. There was no Daimler deal. The car had a negative gross margin. It was not pretty. Oh, and you had you know your larger shareholder just completely pissed off and you know going AWOL. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was ugly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a stressful period. <laughs> um, and that was just at work. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so for a while, it really wasn't a question of profit or <laughs> non-profit. It, it was like, we need to live. How do we live? Um, so that, that was the, the main challenge. Um, and, and, and now, I mean, now we're at the sort of the stage where we can say, okay, um, we, we can shift the dial between the we could, we could make, let's say at this point, a medium amount of profit or a small amount. We've sort of chosen to make a small amount um, because we can reinvest the cash flow into future products. So now we're, you know, right now we're reinvesting the cash flow into developing the, the Model X, which is an SUV, um, and to uh, I increasing the uh, production capacity of the, the factory and do, doing a little bit of advanced planning on the third generation vehicle that'll be um, a, a mass market uh, Sort of affordable, compelling electric car. Um, so, uh, so that, that's really, I guess, what what's meant by, in, in this case, not not pursuing. We're not trying to maximize profit at this point because, 
it, it, it would constrain the business, the growth of the business, um, and constrain the overall objective of transitioning the world towards electric cars. Um, so I've got nothing against profit in, in general, but it's just, it's just, it's not, um, I mean, I actually don't think it's the smart move. I mean, if, if one were to take net present value of future cash flows, I, I think maximizing profit at this stage is actually not the smart move, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, and it's interesting because earlier I said we get back to it. You mentioned that your goal was not to start a company that has the you know the chance of making the most money for you the quickest, right? Yeah. And that the wealth personally is almost a byproduct of these activities of passion. And uh, by analogy, like in the investment field, in venture capital, you know you could look for the thing that'll make the most money the quickest, right? Like a new ad network for social media. But who cares? Right? Like it really <laughs> just doesn't help the world right. in any meaningful way. And. And there are much over longer, if you take a longer term perspective, there are things you could do that don't answer the short term question of what's going to make me the most money this year or this five year period, but over 20 years, focusing on those, ironically, he may make the most money, right, of any yeah. entrepreneur, or these companies might be more profitable than their cohort that doesn't uh, follow that same purpose driven kind of almost messianic zeal. Yeah. So the, the balance question almost implies a dichotomy that may not be opposed, but maybe aligned if you orchestrate it right. Yeah, maybe more of a short-term versus yeah. long-term approach. Yeah, exactly. Great. We have uh, we have one hand up here. We also, oh, up here. Another one up here. Sure. Up here. This will be the last question. Oh, is this the last question? Okay. Um, yes. From your current uh, car marketing strategy, uh, you could say that your car is directed towards the luxury car marketplace. So that's a fairly well-defined uh, market. Do you have any plans for expanding it to? the general marketplace to, uh, say, make a car for the masses, which might be maybe in the twenty-five dollars to $35,000 range? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good question, then. Um, in fact, for the, the, the first blog piece I wrote uh, for Tesla was um, the, the, the Tesla master plan, uh, which is to uh, start off with an expensive, low-volume vehicle, then go to a, a mid-price, mid-volume, and then uh, sort of low, low price, uh, high volume. Um, so we're kind of in phase two, um, and uh, with our third generation vehicle, we uh, expect to be somewhere in the, the $30,000, $35,000 range for the car, uh, which when you take into account the savings from the use of electricity instead of gasoline, um, is more like comparing it in the US to about a $28,000 car, or in Europe to a $20, $22,000 car. Right. And the maintenance is much less, the fuel costs are much lower. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, I want to thank you very much for this and transition to the closing segment of our evening. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Well, um, Elon, uh, congratulations on behalf of uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford uh, Alumni Association, Business School Alumni Association. Uh, uh, Dean Sloan would like to present you, you. with this year's Entrepreneurial Company of the Year. Thanks. Thank you very much.